Hey, you guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new, my name is Allison, and you can find me on Instagram at a devotional heart. My show is called the devotional hearts show. And today my guest is someone who I just, I already know this is going to be a really fun interview. Um, I just discovered him. He was interviewed by my friend, Kevin on his channel. I'll put the link to that in the description so you can watch that. But um, his name is Thaddeus and he is also a Christian life coach. And he actually calls himself an Orthodox coach. I, because I'm not baptized yet, I don't call myself that. I coach Christian women, but I am a life coach who has taken what I learned when I was in the secular coaching world and transformed it into something that can be very helpful and useful for Christian women. And so I'm really curious to hear about Thaddeus's coaching. And so without further ado, welcome to my show, Thaddeus. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So um, to my audience, just want to let you know that we had a little bit of a conversation before I hit record. And already Thaddeus said some really potent, beautiful things about orthodoxy. And if you go to his Instagram and you look at his grid, he has got so much beautiful content on there from the church fathers, book recommendations, fun selfies of himself, just doing fun things in his day-to-day -day life. I mean, this is someone who really loves Christ, loves orthodoxy, and it really shows. So... I'm going to let him just start at the beginning and tell us his conversion story. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, his favorite father that he, his, the book that he loves and recommends all the time. And I want to hear more about that because I haven't read it yet, but it is on the way to me. I did order it. I'm looking forward to that. So stay tuned to get that awesome book recommendation. So why don't you just start and um, tell us your life story and how you found orthodoxy and what drew you to the faith? Well, I started off kind of a mainline evangelical and ended up on the really just on the search for something to do with my life, went to a uh, Bible college uh, in Portland, Oregon, and I, I had I had a good experience. I would say it's a, a great place, but I at the same time I think I experienced a lot of uh, weakness in the Christian tradition when you know kind of everyone can interpret scripture however they want without uh, any backing of history or any kind of uh, oral tradition. And uh, scripture does mention in I think it's 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Paul talks about holding fast to the tradition written in oral. And so there is this concept that there would be um, more things than just the text, even though the text was important. But all of that to say, I, I think where I really, really struggled was the fact that I didn't feel like I was growing. And I, I was growing in some ways, but the in retrospect, I think I was discouraged because I could see that people that weren't Christians were growing in the same way. And it kind of made me wonder, you know, what's the point of being a Christian um, if, if there's no fruit? Is the, is the purpose here just to have a bunch of intellectual answers? And most of the time in my Bible college, it was a pendulum swing from either do good deeds or debate about theology all the time. And that was kind of the two kinds of of personalities and movements was uh, do do more good things for other people and do ministry and service or like have a lot a lot of debates about um, the end times and superlapsarianism and infralapsarianism and all these things that at the end of the day my walk with Jesus isn't going to be very different now serving people that that makes a difference too but um, even Judas even Judas uh, complained about, you know, that oil that you poured on Jesus' feet could have been used to serve people. So even with serving people being a basic part of the gospel, I, I was hungry for something in my heart to actually change. And I noticed that when, even when I did a good deed, there was something in me that was very selfish and wanted to reap whatever I could out of the good deed for myself, you know, get that good feeling of serving someone. And I would notice that if something got in the way of me feeling good, 
then I would get irritable. Mm -hmm. And it, I really felt like when you read scripture and you're reading about this love of God and this love that, that we're supposed to have through him, it seems like it's supposed to be selfless. Like it's supposed to be something that is regardless of what you get out of it. But I could only get myself to do external good. I couldn't get myself to actually have my heart move towards what seemed to be like real love. And so I think that that was kind of an underlying drive in me that I kind of let be dormant just because I didn't know really how to put into words or where to go or what to do about it. I was like, well, this is where the Bible says I'm supposed to be. So I'm going to keep trying where I'm at. So what eventually what happened to me was I had friends introduce me to orthodoxy. Um, I hated it. I did not like the vestments. I did not like the liturgical worship. I did not like what I called canned prayers. Um, I didn't like the iconography. I thought it was ugly, not to mention idolatry. <laughs> and so I was pretty turned off by the whole thing, but it, it got me to look at history in order to try and rebut it. Like I was like, okay, I, you know, I, I know all these, these uh, Protestants that I trust a lot and they've studied history. And so, you know, they would have told me about this if this, you know, had as much credibility as these Orthodox claimant does. But as I read, I started reading Christian history, I reached a point within a matter of months where I went, I don't know if it's Orthodoxy, but I don't think it could be Protestantism because the, the simple version is looking at scripture and the way it talks about the truth will be something that the Holy Spirit protects, that the gates of hell won't prevail over, and it will stay the same and it will last. And even though there'll be wolves, there'll be false teachers, there's this idea that it will stay strong. And so it, it wore on me seeing that a bunch of the traditions I was raised with was stuff that came from men in difficult circumstances trying to come up with new theology to explain their difficult circumstances. And I could get into what that means, but I wanted theology that seemed like it had been, that was revealed by someone divine and protected as if it was that, not something that someone at some point went, oh, you know, maybe, maybe the church is actually invisible rather than visible um, because, you know, I'm not part of the visible church. So it, it pushed me to the point where I started to honestly and openly consider what orthodoxy had to say. And I visited a Catholic church because I wondered maybe I've been close-minded to this too. But what won me was Elder Thaddeus of Vitognitsa, um, his book that you were referencing earlier called Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives. And I visited a monastery with the friends that were telling me to look at orthodoxy. And when I left, the monks gave me that book. Um, and I remember reading it and I guess I would say my heart leapt, like it was reading like what I had been looking for in all of my walk. And both, both as a Christian, because I was there at Bible college, you know, getting a, a Bible and theology degree to, you know, know about God and know about his ways and know how to help other people. But I was also there getting my psychology degree. And in retrospect, Elder Thaddeus was the answer to both of those. What, what he said about how to grow close to God and how to pray differently and how to work on yourself. It was very clear to me uh, pretty quickly that it was what I had been looking for in those other two traditions. And it, it even challenged me. Uh, and I don't, I don't think I've talked about this much in the past, but it challenged me to realize that I had made an idolatry, an idol of psychology. Mm. I realized that I was, was thinking that I could, find all these answers to the universe. And I thought I was going to be, you know, somebody who's writing all these books and some super well-known psychologist. And uh, yeah, it, those kinds of things were going through my head. And as I was becoming Orthodox, I realized like, I specifically have to put this out of my mind. I have to make it kind of like uh, Abraham and Isaac, you know, here's Isaac, who's God's promise, clearly some kind of gift from a gift from God as was promised. And yet for Abraham to truly be right with God, there was something that needed to happen to make sure that Abraham's heart was not misattached to this gift God had given him. And I realized I had done the same thing, that it was, it was becoming something for me that was, you know, in my mind, it was to serve God, but it really was the form of my own godhood, that I could control the universe, and I could fix people and stuff by knowing all these things. And so I had to, to, decide that if God wanted to meet, to be in the psychology realm and doing anything, you know, K 
counselor like or therapeutic, he would have to bring that back to me by force. Um, but I knew it, I was just too tempted by it. And I'd never realized that until reading Elder Thaddeus. And thankfully, you know, that was about five, six years ago, but thank God um, he's had mercy on me. And it seemed like now this last couple of years, it's been coming back um, that I've gotten to do some psychology stuff. But even realizing that my own desire to, you know, fix myself and fix other people, it was actually something getting in the way of that very thing. And so it was, I guess it's, you could say it was very meta, like a lesson about lessons <laughs> that I was abusing. But from there, it, it, it's very insightful. I don't, I don't know a lot of people who, well, I mean, you're saying it was when you read this book, but still it was some level of insight and self-reflection that you took yourself through to to admit to that and and mm. be even be aware of that part of you yeah yeah and it's it was definitely at the tail end of a lot of like personal turmoil and drama in my own heart and relationships and you always catch that that's that's uh very similar like job's story here's here's this man wrestling with god letting horrible things happen to him and here are his friends telling him like, oh, well, bad things happen because you did bad things. And that's karma. That's the teaching of karma. That's the, the view of Hinduism. There's a lot of people that believe that. But at the end of that story, Job's friends actually get rebuked by God for, for saying that about him. God's like, I'm merciful on people. Um, I've got plans much bigger than that, like just dishing out. Uh, like he doesn't have to be a person and he could be an impersonal force like karma, but he's a person. He's doing bigger things. He's doing person things, love things, Trinitarian relationship things. And so when after Job has gone through this difficult time of suffering, you see that that's what prepared his heart to actually have a vision of God. And I, I would I would say when God shows up in the book of Job, you know, he gives these answers that are like, who are you to say this? And who are you to say that? I created this. I created that. And I'll tell you as a therapist. A person working in you know the, the therapeutic realm those would not be things that would comfort a person <laughs> but but what I really believe happens in the story is those are a poem about what actually happens when Job has gone through the suffering it takes the soil of his heart and it churns it he has a, a, a heart that is like all of us hard soil like Pharaoh when his heart is hardened and like uh, in Christ's parable when the the seed is being sown there's different kinds of soil most of us are struggling. I know I am with very hard hearts. And so the soil doesn't receive anything, but the, the suffering God sends those crosses, that's, that's the tilling of the soil. That's God mashing the soil. And when we ask God for help, we're asking for, among other things, this process. Um, but we're also getting churned, it seems regardless, like non-Christians are suffering too. So we're asking him to be in the process with us, strengthening us. So it's it's both of those things, but all of that to say when the soil actually has gone through a lot of this process and is actually soft, a person comes to this point where they're not just interested in God, but they recognize that they need him on a level that there's no other answer. And in that state, when the real presence of God, not just data about him, but when the real presence of the Holy Spirit shows up, um, the heart receives him rather than what you see with Pharaoh, he's a great example. Pharaoh, every, these plagues happen to him and Pharaoh goes, uh, oh my gosh, like I've been wrong. Uh, Yahweh's the real God. You guys can go out and worship. I'm so sorry for what I did. And then he goes right back to it. And it's like, that's what we do. We're like, oh, I repented. Like I went to God. I said the believer's prayer. I did all these things. Like, that's it. And uh, it seems to me it's a little more complicated than that. I think in scripture, it's a little more complicated, but all of that to say, I think that that's, that's what Elder Thaddeus is talking about. And I think that that's the journey that all Christians are going on. And I think, too, that a lot of struggles that Western Christians have today are because that process is not fully understood. That the theology, and we were talking about this earlier a bit, but the theology doesn't quite get you practical understanding of what's going on in your heart. So I, I think that that, that end, of the, end of the story there, that was what won me to orthodoxy. And that was what eventually got me into doing some of this coaching, which my 
I, I was like, I don't have a counseling degree. I don't have even like life coach training. I have my four-year psychology degree, but all my friends and family and my priest were saying, you should do this. Also, you don't like doing anything else. Every other job you've done, you've said was unsatisfying and boring and this you love doing. So why not just make a career or something, you know, uh, that you can make a living off of with it. So that's, that's how I got where I am. <laughs> that's awesome. What a great story. So let's go back a little bit. I want to talk about repentance because this is a big one for, especially for atheists, people in the secular world and new agers. I was a new ager for a very long time and there's absolutely zero consideration of repentance and why we need it. And, and so talk a little bit about that. And, um, and then we also were talking about um, shame. And so give us your reflections on those things. Yeah, I'm looking here in my little quote stash. I don't, uh, I'm not seeing where I kept it, but I believe it's St. John Climacus who says that um, to repent is not to look downward at our own sins, but it's to look upward at God's um, mercy. Mm -hmm. And I think if we, if we boil down repentance in something that's true that's still true like we don't want to distort the truth with it but that's very simple and, and um accessible to everyone repentance is to say to god god i cannot love on my own this world not only needs me to do good but most of all it needs my heart to love it to have this unselfish agape love that is that would be divine if we had it it's because it's god himself first john says god is love and it like drives home that that's very literal that's just not like God is loving, but he is love. And if you have love, you have God. And if you don't have love, you don't have God. And uh, Paul says, if you don't have love, you're a noisy clanging symbol. Like nothing you say actually means anything. It doesn't matter. It's empty. So there's, so repentance is to recognize, first of all, recognize that we are not loving, that something in us is off and imperfect. And I think even the most secular people, the people least interested in religion, they know that that's true. Like they know that, you know, they get married and they have conflicts with people. Um, a lot of times we'll say like, oh, it's because I suffered. I had this thing and I had that thing. And it is true that pain and suffering and fear are very valid things that push us towards sin. And the fathers will talk about this, that God sees that God understands. But ultimately what we see in Christ is that if we actually had divine love, we would be unstoppably loving. Like even Here's Christ on the cross, one of my favorite points in scripture, and he's had the worst evil that's ever been done in history done to him. And he looks on these people and he could say, man, God, I'm kind of mad at them because they did something awful to me. But he says, forgive them. They know not what they do. And when we see that, we're not just seeing like, a, oh, a good moral teacher that this is a way to live. We're being revealed, one, what divinity is. It's to love like that. Two, we're being told what we're being offered. When Christianity is brought to us, when the gospel is brought to us, what we're being offered is to have our hearts transformed to love like that. So when Christ says, be perfect as I am perfect, that's not a figure of speech. That's not a metaphor. That is his command. And this entire religion is to bring us to that point. So repentance is the start of this life because how, how can you get help from God if you don't think that you have a problem? <laughs> like his whole thing is, I'm coming to you to help you with this problem. I've sent the law to reveal that you have this problem because you can't fulfill that. I've sent these saints to be great examples for you, but you know, you ignore them and instead you judge the Pharisees or uh, you judge like publicans and sinners and stuff. God has sent all these things so that man knows I need God. Like I'm made in his image. I, I have some beautiful things he's given me, but I'm not complete. I, I need something more. And, and really what you need is there's a hole in your heart that's Jesus shaped basically. And so once he's in there and the more that he's in there, the more, um, well, there's a lot of great things, but the more peace we have, the more, as the fathers say, we see other people's real needs. We see our own needs. We, all these things that our mind are, are, uh, passions are generating that are telling us like, oh, that person said that because they think low, uh, lowly of you. Oh, that person said that because uh, 
you're, you know, you're not very smart. And so, you know, you need to show them that you're smarter than they think uh, you are. And so all of these little voices, as we, we transition to that place through the methods of Elder Thaddeus, and he's just carrying on the tradition of 2000 years of orthodoxy, I would argue, but uh, these methods are designed so that all those little voices that have come to kind of the, be the God that guides us and saves us and protects us, all these methods, they cut that out. And so repentance is the foundation of that. It is the first layer of recognizing that there's a problem, the work needs done. And it's the very reason Christ's whole preaching ministry starts with repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's here, like, and what he plans to do and finish in you is here. So admit that you need it. Admit that there's problems. And that's the beginning of these two things coming together and doing their work. So repentance isn't supposed to be some, oh, I'm so awful. I'm so horrible. I'm the worst. Um, there is a healthy level at which we have what the fathers would call contrition of heart, where we actually are grieved. But that's, that's really, um, well, here I have a quote here from Alter Thaddeus. He says, uh, the fear of God is when you love him, when you truly love him with all your heart and you strive never to offend or sadden him, not only with your deeds, actions, and words, but also with your thoughts. You try to please him in everything you do or say. So, so the thing that's grieving us, it's not that we're some horrible person, we're so disgusting. The thing that's grieving us is that we've wronged someone we love and who loves us. And that's, again, if we understand it rather than this nebulous uh, shame thing, if we actually understand it as a human thing, we get that. We get what it's like to love someone and to do something wrong and then realize, man, I'm, I'm heartbroken because of what I've done to them. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for just that real authentic recognition that, you know, we've hurt someone that loves us. But from there, God asks nothing of us except to come to him and to work with him to make it right. So it, even though there's that point at which we realize we've done something wrong, we have that healthy guilt and the fathers will call it shame. Sometimes that gets confusing in translation, but they're talking about the healthy guilt, the healthy contrition, but that should always end. And this is something I tell my clients often. If, you, if you're in that state, or even if you've healthily chosen to be in that state where you look at yourself and you analyze and you maybe weep over the things that you've done, anytime you do that, it always has to end with remembering God's mercy. It always has to end with that. Um, because otherwise, it leads us to being our own God. We're trying to go, oh, I've done this bad thing, and I've got to solve it. Maybe I'll beat myself up. Maybe I'll do this, that, or the other thing. I've got to solve it. And the problem is, is that's just more distance from the only guy that can help us, which is Christ. So we, we do have to have that contrition and that healthy shame but it should always end with reminding ourselves, and yet the Lord is merciful as he mm -hmm. promises. And even that word mercy, before learning about orthodoxy, I didn't even really understand that word. And I heard it explained to me as like a salve, like a healing salve of God's love. Um, it's not just like when you're wrestling with your little brother and he's got, and, or your big, your older brother has got you pinned down and you have to say mercy for him to let go. It's not, it's not yeah. about that. It's like, healing. don't punish me. Well, yeah. it's that, but it's a lot more than that. Yeah. So I'd love to hear your reflections on, on grace and mercy and, and, and how, how orthodoxy, like what that has to do with our our spirit, our tradition, which is infused by the Holy Spirit? Well, I think a, a great way, place to start is the fact that orthodoxy understands justice differently than the West does. Uh, a lot of the Western traditions, this is not all of them, it's hard to talk about the West because there's so many traditions, but they have some things very much in common. Once you step outside of the West, you look back and you do see they have more in common than they realize. But one of the things in the West is that they, they see justice in a very judicial way. And especially they see justice as retribution a lot of the time. You know, justice is if you do a bad thing, there's suffering you have to experience that somehow like makes up for that. And, and this idea that, you know, God's justice is that somehow that makes the world a better place, that things get 
you know, punished. And I would say sometimes retribution is in God's toolkit. That's an entirely biblical idea. And he has the right to be retributive. I've had, I've had these debates a lot with people. So it's always interesting uh, getting down to the nuance, but God does have the right to be retributive. He could punish any one of us for what we've done and he would be in the right technically. And sometimes he is retributive. In fact, I think part of basic parenting is to at times be gently retributive with your kids. It's not a matter of like, they need to experience your wrath or something like that, but you're teaching kids that the world has consequences. And so you gently say, Hey, you know, we set this rule and you haven't been caring about this rule. You've been, you know, breaking it. And I know you, you do know better. So I love you. I don't enjoy punishing you, but I'm going to give you this repercussion so that you'll learn. And God does do that. He does allow um, retribution and send it at times when it's good for us. But the idea of justice that I would argue is the the truly biblical one, and it's definitely the historical one. Um, Father Stephen DeYoung's book, God is a Man of War, if anybody wants to read more about this great book for understanding some of this, but basically justice is healing. Justice is making things right. And it's the same word as justification, which is another word the West kind of has a unique definition of, but justification in its broadest sense is to complete something. So uh, I, I worked with my dad when I was younger doing general contracting. And sometimes we would put down at the bottom of the wall like a piece of trim board. So it's just that nice decorative board that goes between the carpet and the wall. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'd cut a piece and you'd stick it in and there was you know, this section left, the board wasn't long enough. And so we'd go, we'd measure it out. What does this need? You're kind of diagnosing what's missing. And then you, you know, go try and create the exact piece that would go in there. And what's that, what that's called to put that piece in there that finishes it, that's called justifying. You justify the distance. That's the way that word is actually used. And so we use it that way in legal terminology, like, you know, you, someone did something wrong and uh, maybe, maybe you stole a million dollars from someone and the courts say, you know, you have to give back a certain amount, but you've only given them back half. Well, legally you'd have to justify why you didn't give the other half. So justification is like that filling in of something that's not there. Um, but there's a presupposition, presupposition in the West that that's a primarily legal thing. And I would argue it is a whole and ontological thing that when God says uh, in Philippians, he promises that he will be faithful to bring about to completion the good work he's doing in us. And James talks about going back to what I was saying earlier with Job that uh, we have to consider it pure joy when we face trials because they produce perseverance and perseverance must finish its work. So we will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Those again are just as literal as uh, be perfect as I am perfect. So God's justice, when he's, when he's saying he's going to be just in the old Testament and new Testament, what he means is he's going to make everything right. He's not going to just pay back some evil people for the evil they've done. That's in there too. He's going to make things right and balanced. And the main way he does this, and this is very key to Orthodox theology, the main way he does this is by healing humans, because that's where the whole problem started. When humans started to operate uh, at the very beginning without God, which is what we see with Eve, it starts that very moment when Satan tempts her. He says, hey, look at this fruit. It seems like it's really appealing, right? And she doesn't go, God, is this guy right? Like she doesn't look up at her dad, her father, and ask for his input. She goes entirely by her own reason. That's the very next thing you see is she looked at it and she thought it looked good for eat. It was beautiful and appealing to the eye. It looked good for food, et cetera. And that's the moment where the problem starts, but it gets worse from there. Then God comes and tries and uh, finds that once they realize they had a problem, they do the same thing over again. They try and solve it themselves. They've now they've sown these fig leaves on themselves because they're already in this habit of solving all their problems themselves. Yeah. Whereas the church fathers say, if they would have repented in that moment, mm -hmm. God would have forgiven them and there would not have been a problem, mm -hmm. but you see it spiral out of control until it gets to Cain and Abel, where now it takes the form of murder, but it all starts with operating our lives independently from God. Mm -hmm. And so justice is God come is healing the things that have grown twisted in our hearts because we weren't there. He wasn't there as we grew and then him taking that space. And now we have the only place we can get real agape love, which is him being present in our hearts. And so 
when God heals us, when Christ comes and does the work that's needed to heal us, that's the greatest revelation of God's justice, because that's what's actually going to heal everything. The rocks cry out, the animals cry out, all of creation cries out because man broke everything. So all of those things are going to stop crying out as man is healed. So part of how, to bring it full circle, part of how God fulfills his justice is not just retribution. It's also by mercy. It's by him saying, hey, this thing that you did wrong, I know you get it. And I know that me punishing you would not push you towards the truth right now. It would discourage you even more. So I'm merciful and I will not do that to you. Whatever will push you towards good, towards healing and towards me, that's the standard 100% of the time. And that's what we should think when we think we have a just God. And that's what we should think, in my opinion, when we think we have a merciful God. But it is, going back to what you were saying, deeper than just him not punishing us. It is that actual... I guess I would call it energy going on inside of God that he pours out that we experience. So his mercy is expressed as him not punishing us, but there's a lot of other forms it takes kind of like you were, were getting at. So, yeah. That was amazing. That was beautiful. So everything you just said, this is, um, uh, forgive me if this sounds really ignorant or I don't know <laughs> if it'll even make sense. Um, this understanding that you've, just shared with us, you had this type of understanding after becoming Orthodox, or did you already, when you were a Western Christian going to Bible college, did you already see it that way? Or is this an Orthodox infused kind of view of of and Eve and mercy and those things? It's, it's orthodoxy, definitely. Okay. I, I would say there, I had the shadows of it, kind of, kind of an experience like Plato's cave where you see the shadows and they're based on the real thing, but you don't see the real thing. Mm-hmm. I think I saw lots of good shadows, I guess I would call it. Um, teachers, uh, psychology, I think psychology points to orthodoxy. Um, I feel like every, all of my experience before orthodoxy was setting me up to find orthodoxy. I had no idea that that was what was happening, but that very clearly in retrospect, that was what God was doing. And uh, I would say that what I saw before this was, was the shapes of the empty spaces. Like I could see some of the things that my heart needed, just a handful of them you could, because I had, you, you know what you have experience with. That's something I say often is what you've experienced, you know. So you might not know the food which I would argue is orthodoxy, but you do know what hunger is like. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you've been hungry a long time, what it's like to have food once you finally get it. Mm-hmm. So I would say I knew some of this only in that I knew the hunger. But once I started reading Elder Thaddeus, and even more so living the life of the church, yeah. because all of this advice is Again, it's not Western. It's not like you can just read this guru and then go home and do like a meditation practice. That's a piece of it because that's part of what humans are. All these things are, all of orthodoxy, we could look at it from this perspective. All of orthodoxy is a therapeutic treatment that God has ordained to heal man. So it's all these little things we think and say and do that are medicine for us, Mm -hmm. that bring us closer to him and that transform us. And so part of what psychology has realized is that humans can't transform only by the power of their heads. That's impossible. And the more we study it, the more it's like absurd as we find out how humans actually work. Our bodies and our minds are linked. So for example, um, we, we know from psychology, we've known for a long time that say you're uh, feeling confident or you're feeling resistant, you'll cross your arms. But we're finding out now that if you want to feel confident or resistant, cross your arms and it will actually embolden that in you. And I would say orthodoxy has known this truth for a long time. We know that a humble man will have a tendency towards prostrating himself towards other people. Um, But we also know that a person can prostrate themselves and it's not humble. They're out of pride. They're just faking. They're just doing an empty act. But just because that's the case doesn't mean that these things don't pair together. And so an, an example would, uh, a metaphor for this would be 
if you're if you're climbing a, a rock wall, you know your your stability is based on the fact that you're holding on very tightly with two hands and your feet. But you can let go with a hand and you're still safe. And then you move that up higher and you grab on. And now that stability provided by the other attributes. Now you can let go of this. And we see this with the, the mind and the body that they assist each other. That if you want something to be part of your heart, you do physical actions that foster that to build inside of you. And likewise, uh, when something is in your heart, it will lead to physical actions. So if you have love, you will sacrifice more for people. But if you don't have love, sacrifice for people and ask God for love. And the, the acting out of sacrifice and suffering for others will make the room in your heart for more love. So much, uh, this is one of the strategies of the fathers, is this interplay of the physical and the spiritual, even though the physical is spiritual. I don't like that dichotomy too much, but this, this internal and external, they assist each other. We see this in husbands and wives. We see this in the Trinity. There's a reason that the fathers say that man is a microcosm. He's like a miniature version of all the things that are, God is doing in the rest of the universe. So we see this interplay back and forth. And that's, that's just one example, but so much of, of what the fathers give to us. Oh, and the main point I was getting to is that it's things we have to do. And so church is one of those things to go and see other people, see icons, smell incense, taste bread and taste the body and blood of Christ. Um, hear the music, hear the chanting, hear the bells. Like our whole body is being integrated so that our hearts, if they want to move towards God, because we can, of course, like I said, we can be there and not want to move towards God and we won't. But if we're there wanting to move towards God, having that faith, even just this much intention to move towards God, all those things come in and are gifts of God to assist us. Things that man can't figure out on his own. Maybe we know little bits from psychology, maybe the Buddhists and the Hindus knew fragments of it, but the wholeness of what we need to heal body and soul it's it's all there <laughs> it's all there beautiful I don't, I don't know if you mentioned crossing ourselves too and prostrating and that you know that's Definitely a physical crosses. act and then and I love singing in divine liturgy it's such a beautiful way to worship God and also keeping our eyes open and um, participating with the saints and the icons that you know the that visually it's part of it too and um yeah I, i'm always encouraging my audience anybody who has not visited an orthodox church or has not been to divine liturgy to go and check it out and just have an experience with it yeah even even carl jung the the famous psychologist um i found out recently from another from Orthodox podcast I was listening to, he recognized, like he's not a Christian, but he recognized that liturgical worship specifically was according to the nature of man, which is mind blowing to me that this secular guy completely, well, not, he's not outside Christendom. He's commenting on Christendom and he's saying some true things and some really absurd things, <laughs> but he has opinions on the book of Job. I don't like my favorite old Testament book. If, if that hasn't become obvious here, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, Carl, Carl Jung recognized that the liturgy formed men and it formed them in a good way. And the fact that a secular psychologist recognized something that, uh, and this isn't just 2000 years old, this is as old as the Old Testament worship. When God gives that worship in the Old Testament, he's giving the therapy in advance. Like this is, it's a foreshadowing of when Christ comes and fulfills the worship through the Eucharist, but it's, it's many other things. And so as soon as Christ comes and the apostles, their first meeting in the synagogues, and then they're meeting in house churches, they don't stop doing this worship. There's no, there's no evidence, no reason to believe they stopped that they were just singing um, happy fun songs. They were probably doing that too, but they knew that like writing your own songs and creating music that responded to God and praised him it was something additional to the worship in spirit and truth, which was the Old Testament worship and the divine liturgy. Um, the Catholics still have a form of this, and it's, we, they call it the Mass. Um, even a lot of Protestants still do liturgical worship because it's a known thing that this is undeniably a tradition of God that is thousands of years old. But now we know from natural revelation that it's also according to the psyche of man. 
that it, it all fits together as one whole. So being there, being still, uh, it's, uh, well, I'll, I, think, I think you'd be really interested in this and I haven't talked about this much publicly. I tried to record a video on this a while back. Um, one of the things I've been studying is attention and what is good for our attentiveness, what makes us more present and what is distracting. And we live in a world right now in particular that is a massive web of distractions. Absolutely. And yeah, and we've, we've, we're down to a science with it. I mean, I remember being a kid and there were books coming out about like video games being addictive. And, you know, we knew television wasn't that good for you. And now we're coming to the point where it's, it's a million times worse because I mean, even, even stuff like a movie, you know, a movie, well, one, I think there's a huge amount of benefits to movies and symbolism. People need movies to process. It's a kind of therapy, but I won't get too much into that. <laughs> but it, but movies, you know, they are entertainment. They are fun too. Mm -hmm. And so, but it used to take effort to see a movie. You had to, you know, work, earn a fair amount of money, go to a movie theater. And then we got the home movies. You still had to bring them home. You could look through your physical library in the real world and you picked out a movie. Well, now we're to the point where we have streaming services and Mind you, I have a bunch of tabs open right now of multiple streaming services, so I can't knock it too much. <laughs> but we have this system where, where you just, you pin your mind, your eyes on the screen and your body's done. Besides like maybe your scroll finger, if you're at your PC or your remote your clicker, but your body is lost in this interaction. And now you just go through going, brain, what would gratify you the absolute most? I have a million options, all probably all things that if I forced myself to watch a bunch of them, I'd find it just as gratifying and entertaining, but I'm sitting here with my whole noose, <laughs> if, if for people who know the orthodox term, my whole noose and my focus, my being is not connected to my body. So half of me is gone. And the rest of it is how do I get the most pleasure? What here is the number one pleasure I can get? And we're now to the point where those things don't satisfy us. And I think uh, The Onion, which is a, a humorous news service, like does parody news, they had, a, they had a joke article that people can now pay $4 a month for Netflix and all they get is the scrolling. They don't <laughs> actually watch anything. They just get to scroll. $4 a month, you do the same scrolling you already do. But I think that that's a powerful example of the fact that our minds are being groomed to and they're groomed because it's profitable. That's all, that's all it is. But they're groomed to jump from attention to attention. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing that I see right now is these games that are on mobile phones. And I'm a gamer too, so I'm not going to all the stuff I like. But the games we've got on mobile phones now have these timers on them because the, the game companies know that, that the whole like sit and binge a game for six hours or something, it's not realistic. They know it looks bad. Like we're, we're real, they're realizing like, they've been ad advertising games as addictive. And now they're realizing, okay, people realize that that's actually a bad thing now. Uh, but what they have is these, these timers where you'll get a certain number of, Candy Crush was the one that started this, I believe, or made it popular. You get like three lives, three times you can lose, and then you can't come back and play for a certain amount of time. What that does is, is it creates a win-win for them because one, you can pay real money and get more lives. So that's where they're making their money. Oh my God. Or, you get a certain amount of time. And what that does is that trains your brain to be on a cycle of anticipating the game. You, you'll, you'll use up your three lives and the game will say in three hours, you get more lives. So what are you doing? You're going throughout your day. And then three hours from then a little thing pops up and says, you have more lives. Well, then eventually you get to this point. I've seen it when I was playing, when I've been playing some of these games uh, where you start scheduling when you play because you know three hours from now I'm going to have another break and I can use more of my lives oh my and what you've done is you've created the system that guides your day is this mobile game and what's crazy if you're orthodox what's crazy is is this is according to the nature of man this is why in the bible there are references to hours of prayer there's hours of prayer in the old testament Acts says the apostles kept the hours of prayer. And we know for all of history, Christians have honored this concept of hours of prayer. We have specific prayers for it, but the very idea that you have times of the day that you pray, what it does is it structures your mind so that your mind is constantly on godly things, that it's constantly on your faith, 
on God, on the church, on saints. And so when you're going through your day, the subconscious systems that are your anchors, your, your anchors of time, your markers of time are the church. But what we have is consumerism, discovering these same mechanisms independently because they're just part of God's creation. And not maliciously, but definitely for profit, just adapting the games to what gets people to play them more. And we've got a lot of people now in the West looking at Eastern religions because long before psychology and natural and uh, the revelation of nature revealed this stuff, I mean, Buddhists knew about this. Taoists knew about this. Hindus knew about this. A lot of humans, the Greeks knew about this. Marcus Aurelius knew about this. Like most cultures in human history outside of Western culture, because it's so linear, knew about consciousness, about how it worked, about um, over gratifying it. And so we've got a lot of people in this fast paced world who are turning to Eastern gurus because the Eastern gurus are saying, hey, here's how you undo that. If these, if these games and this fast paced society and these schedules and calendars and businessiness, if they make you distracted and you can't even focus and you can't even hear your family members at the dinner table because you're thinking about the next time you get Candy Crush lives, like, and this is what's going on with our children, like people are looking for the antidote to that. And so some of these Eastern religions are offering meditative practices where what you're doing is the inversion of that. You're taking your focus and you're placing it on one thing. Usually you're breathing. That's the main thing they focus on. Put your mind on your breathing and just notice your breathing. And what will happen is, is your mind will go, oh, what's that thing I got to do later? Oh, no, gently bring it back to your breathing. And this is, I'd argue this is a, a there's the, the Eastern religions have a lot more things to meditation that I would warn to stay away from. <laughs> but some of the things like that, very basic uh, exercises for the mind are very good. Uh, they are to our mind what uh, push-ups and pull-ups are to the body. Mm -hmm. They are a workout that is just according to nature. And like I said, most people knew this. But the cool thing is, and kind of bringing a lot of this stuff full circle, is that all of the stuff I've said, if you do what the church fathers say, if you do what Elder Thaddeus says, if you practice the Jesus prayer, which is the same practice, but it's not just breathing, and it doesn't even have to be breathing, that's only one specific thing, It's it's that the thing you put your mind on is the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you gently and quietly say that. And then you say it. And of course, like I was talking about earlier, we'll use a prayer rope because that's the physical aligning with what's going on in your head. Mm -hmm. So you move a, a bead or a knot of the prayer rope as you say it. And then your mind starts to think about, you know, that one person that offended you earlier, because that's what the fathers say is the demons will send these thoughts and you'll go, no, nope, Lord, Jesus Christ. And you just bring it back. And what will happen is, in addition to the fact that you are bonding with the Lord, that you are seeking him, assuming that that's your true intention in this prayer. Obviously, if you don't have that intention, it's not going to do that. But if you want to be his friend and you're praying this prayer with that desire, as a side effect, your ability to focus heals. And that's like my whole thing really is that all of the things psychology discovers the, what the church fathers teach as a side effect, not even the primary goal. In the Eastern religions, it's your primary goal. When you go to certain life coaches, it's their primary goal. You go to a traditional psychologist, their primary goal is to kind of get you some peace with yourself. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But what's amazing is that you do this practice of prayer with the primary goal to seek Christ. Yeah. And as just a secondary thing thrown in by the nature of God's order of creation, all these subcategories of psyche and relationships and such are just also fulfilled. Yeah. You also have the healing of your attention and your goal wasn't to heal your attention. You didn't go to the Jesus prayer looking to heal your attention. You went seeking Christ as you should. Mm -hmm. And as a bonus, there's an observable healing that goes on Mm -hmm. that renders the need for Buddhism and these other practices pointless. So yeah, this is just one example of psychology and even Eastern religions, all of them pointing to the church fathers and yet the church fathers going above and beyond anywhere that they are. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I was really into Eastern mysticism and I even went to India to stay at an ashram and hopefully learn some these magical powers that were being taught by this guru. 
or, you know, like techniques and, um, mm. they, he had this whole thing worked out in a way to attract Westerners to pay him a lot of money, but that's a whole nother story. But, um, I did, I did a lot of meditation. And so in, in that new age period of my life, it was always, I'm not saying this is like traditional Eastern concept or anything that's more modern day new age concept of being becoming a god you know um it all self-focused very very much worship of the self and balancing the chakras and i was a massage therapist so you know like reiki having the energy the healing energy coming out of your hands and i never i i became a reiki master but i I wasn't that crazy about it. But anyway, when I started re reading the Bible in 2020 in the summer, and then I shifted, it just goes along with what you're saying. I shifted my meditation practice into worship of God and wanting to know Christ and wanting the truth at all costs. And then it became, and I was, I didn't know anything about orthodoxy yet. So I didn't know about the noose. I didn't know about any of the transformational benefits of the orthodox church and the traditions and and everything that we learn from the fathers i didn't know any of that stuff and it really was amazing how within three four months of every night now practicing my meditation and not even calling it meditation anymore i called it devotion devotional practice because instead of worshiping myself now I'm pray. It's a prayer to God. I want to know you. I want, I want you to reveal yourself to me, you know? And, um, it just makes me really emotional because the, I was so sincere in my desire and it, and it led me to orthodoxy. And I mean, that's, that's a little piece of my story that I haven't even shared online yet. Um, but it, it is a very important part of my transformation out of the new age and into Christianity because it didn't happen overnight. Some people just go from teaching about speaking with your spirit guides to like Doreen Virtue. She, it was really overnight. I think, I think she's the one I'm thinking of. Um, so I, I've listened to a lot of testimonies and I'm not one of those people that just all of a sudden was a Christian. I had to take my time, read the Bible. I still haven't read the whole thing yet. I still have a lot to learn. That's why I started this channel to learn from my guests and continue to learn from my priests and the parishioners and reading the church fathers. And like you said earlier, which I really loved, you said something about the depth, you know, how, um, what did you say? Um, it was really beautiful. Do you remember <laughs> that, that there's like this, these layers of depth that you get with orthodoxy. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that when I stopped worshiping myself and learned what repentance was and started to practice that, and then make my meditation all about myself into wanting to know God and wanting to draw closer to him, my whole life changed my relationships, my marriage, and just the way I live my life, just like the peace that you mentioned. That was one of the first things I noticed too, was um, just a profound sense of peace that took over the anxiety and the, the existential anxiousness that I had previously before opening the Bible and being, being open to the word that could influence me through, you know, this amazing thing called the Bible that I had never cared about up until 2020. So I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, one of the, the things Elder Thaddeus, I first heard it from him and it's, it's funny because it's something it's one of those things that I, I mean, I knew this technically when I was Protestant, but I was never modeled how to actually form my life around it. Um, it so, you know, well, use Buddha as an example. Buddha, you know, he's, he starts off in this palace, you know, he's a prince and he has all this, 
you know, stuff, everything he needs and wants. And because of that, because he's almost like skipped to the end of what all of us are wasting our time striving for, he saw how empty it was. And so he goes out on this quest. He, he goes to the Hindu aesthetics who are really harsh on themselves. And he doesn't think that that works, which is really insightful in itself. Um, but eventually he gets to this point where he, the way I would word it is he realizes that when he lives as if he has no self, he is happier, he's more at peace. And he, he notices, which we're discovering with quantum mechanics now, that the material world is kind of one whole. Like we see these distinctions between objects and, and different things, but really it's all connected in one. And, you know, what's, what's a, a carrot one, what's dirt one day is a carrot the next day, like the nutrients go into the seed and now it's a carrot. Like those are the same particles. So he's realizing there's this connectedness and he starts to go, okay, if everything in the universe is kind of one whole, and, and when I live without a self, like an individual cut out from the whole, I'm happier and I treat people better, then maybe there's no self. Maybe I'm just part of this nebulousness and I'd be more at peace. And that's kind of the, the basis of, of the enlightenment that he finds. And now I would argue on a side note, because I feel this is important, that he's right. He's 100% right. But then in addition to that, God comes along and defies that order and does something miraculous within it. He goes down to this planet of dirt and all this material that's you know interwoven and interacting according to the rules of nature he's established. And he takes some of the dirt and he breathes his spirit into it. And now this dirt that's just dirt like everything else, suddenly it's a person. And even now we struggle. I mean, the secular world can't explain why this is me right here. Even though like my finger could get cut off, it could fall into the dirt, it could like, you know, erode away, become nutrients down in the dirt. And then uh, someone could plant a, you know, a carrot seed there. I don't know why I always go for the carrot, but, uh, and the carrot goes out of it and takes away these nutrients. It's from my old finger. Someone else eats it. The nutrients go into them. And now the nutrients are part of them. It, are those nutrients them or me kind of thing? And you could ask those crazy questions like in the resurrection, will the particles be part of them or part of me? You know, we have these questions that are valid, but the truth is, is they're totally a mystery. That's the orthodox answer. And so St. John of Kronstadt specifically addresses this. He says that, that the nature of matter is its malleableness, that it's all doing the shifting and transforming. And, and he says, but God, God defies that. Like it's a, it's a miracle that God takes this matter and breathes man into it. But I would say Buddha, you know, he's, he's coming up with this theory that makes sense that there must be no self he's corrected by Christ because Christ says you do have a self. Your self is sick. Your self is an icon of me. It is this miraculous thing that defies the world, but it's real and it's supposed to exist. You are supposed to have a self, yeah. but it's sick and it's not aligned with me. So it's wreaking havoc and doing all this damage. Mm -hmm. And so Christ offers to heal that self. So the reason that Christianity offers Along with that, that we are more at peace when we live like we have no self is because what's actually happened is that our self has this illness of seeing ourselves as our own God. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean rationally up here. Sometimes it does. Uh, we could be narcissists and such. But um, pride in the fathers is, is a much more broad concept. Pride is exactly what you were talking about. Um, pride is that total reliance on self. And so the reason I would argue that what Buddha did actually was somewhat therapeutic was because he opposed that. The self wants to be a tyrant. It wants to rule everything. But the problem is, is that the only this illness came about because, again, Christ is missing from our hearts. It's, it's like roots that grew into a spot they weren't supposed to be because it was empty. And now they're all in there mangled up and it's unhealthy and we're not operating right because this was never how it was supposed to be that our own self takes in the center that Christ is supposed to fill. And so when Christians have peace, where that comes from is, is knowing that there is a sovereign God that takes care of us. Even the 12 step programs are like, we don't know why this works, but for some reason, when you live, like there's a higher power that takes care of everything, it makes a lot of your problems go away. They were discovering the same thing Buddhists did, but again, it's already in the fathers. The fathers can give you a method and they can tell you a much more true and better answer, which is you were designed to be fully reliant on a loving God. 
And so when you forget that he's there, when you're not connected with him, suddenly you live in a world that's chaos. Things aren't governed by his love anymore. They're governed by things like odds and probability, which is horrifying. Because if it's odds and probability and I want something in the odds and probability world, what do I have to do? I have to study the odds and probability. I have to study science. I have to study how people work. And I have to make this religious level of faith in my mental system so that I can operate in this world and make it do what I want and pull all the levers. Mm -hmm. But when God is loving, when he says, I will give you everything that you need, like when you taste and see that it's not just a message you hear but you can actually see it in your church in your fellow parishioners in the saints in the stories that are anchored to your life all of that brings a very natural peace to your heart because all those things that caused us unpeace those generally come out of the self-godhood and full circle that's really what elder thaddeus and the orthodox tradition focuses in on and the reason why when you do orthodox spirituality as a side benefit, you get psychological healing because so many of our conflicts with other people, our insecurity, all these things we're struggling with, they're because our hearts still have this habit ingrained in them of protecting themselves, of providing for themselves, of defending themselves. So this whole therapeutic tradition and part of what I work with clients with on my like beginner level is doing prayers and doing practices that keep the heart from walking through those old paths of self-trust and replacing them with prayer and giving God an opportunity basically to show up and to provide and to give us peace. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's the, the crux in a way. And I'll, I'll read this great quote here from uh, Metropolitan Flacos. Uh, he writes a book called Orthodox Psychotherapy. It's a more mechanical take on all of this, but he says, the whole tradition of the Orthodox Church consists in healing and bringing to life the soul which is dead from sin, to which all the sacraments and the whole ascetic life of the Church contribute. Anyone who is not aware of this fact is unable to sense the atmosphere of the Orthodox tradition. Mm. Wow. I love that. You're very good at finding great quotes. Yeah. That's Instagram is I'll encourage, I would encourage anyone watching if you're on social media one of the best things you can do to kind of redeem it. Uh, not that it's not a great idea to get off social media, but one of the best ways to redeem it is go follow a bunch of church father accounts. Yeah. There's tons of them. There's people that post these quotes all the time mm -hmm. and honestly, one of the biggest influences on my spiritual life has just been reading these quotes on Instagram. Yeah. If I'm being completely honest, a huge part, part of my practice, my training is just that I've read these all the time and I've read them for like five years mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And I think all of this wisdom and therapy and it's, it's like I said, it's not just like to give us peace in like, a, oh, I want to feel better and I want to mm -hmm. do meditation. So I operate better. Those are not bad things in any way, mm -hmm. but this is like the one, as Christ says, there's one thing needful. And this is it. Like it's, it was an amazing moment for me realizing that the world is full of people seeking truth, seeking spiritual wisdom, seeking guidance and growth. Like I think our stories were, we were both seeking that in all these different areas. Mm -hmm. And this is it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're looking, one of the things I, I note to people all the time is people are, people are doing like going out and doing ayahuasca and stuff, trying to, to have visions of the divine. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're not in tune with God and you're looking inside yourself for the divine, well, there's only thing that one thing inside you that looks anything divine and that's yourself. Yeah. And you're going to mistake yourself pretty easily for being that divine because you are the icon of it. You are the image of it. So it's, it's very, very easy to do that, but we are warned by the Orthodox tradition. And I think that this is very important is this is the understanding of our demonology. I, I was raised with some of the, and again, there's truth to this, but I was raised with some of the like, oh my gosh, there's demons, like, and they're going to get you and you're going to watch Harry Potter and they're going to get you because, you know, there's, there's magic in that. And so demons are going to get you everywhere. <laughs> and it's very refreshing to read the fathers because what they, they say is, is the demon, just like God has 
I, what I want to way watering it down, but I want to call a mechanism. There is a mechanism and an identity to God. There is a way his justice and his love and faith and all these things work. They're not just these words that you hear them and you kind of know what they mean because, uh, you know, you use the word faith every day. Like we have to be educated, not just in the words of scripture, but what they mean. And some of the stories in scripture teach us what the words mean. So we can't just go to like, you know, legal terminology and get definitions for what justification and glorification are. We go to what do, is the work God does in scripture. That's how we know what these words mean. Um, but Satan has a mechanism too. He has a way that he operates and it is the inversion of God. And if God's whole thing is, I will seek you no matter what, and whatever is good for you, I will do it. And if I have to suffer for you, I will do it. This is the revelation of agape love. Uh, forgive them. They know not what they do. Um, the inverse of that is I am my own person and you better not threaten that in any way. If you make me feel uncomfortable with the decisions I've made, you are wronging me. Not just if you won't let me do what I want. If you make me feel uncomfortable for any decision I make, you've wronged me. And I am so intent on focusing on myself and making my will known and manifesting my will. This is all how Satan thinks that I will make all of you do it. And if you don't do it, I will bite you and I will get back at you. That's something you see in a lot of stories of the fathers in uh, the guru, the young man and elder Paisios. You see the demons will tell some person, I'll give you powers. I'll give you all these things. And they build the person's ego. They build their pride. And then maybe they can do some miracle, some demonic miracle, and it builds their pride more. But eventually they come to someone like St. Paisios, who is a humble and holy man, who has the antithesis of the pride that they have. He knows before God, he's nothing, meaning he needs God's help so much. And he spent his whole life seeking God, seeking his help. That humble man comes against this man full of demons and who is working visible miracles and has super strength. And St. Paisios just will like take a, well, one of the stories I believe that's in that book is, is uh, the, the guy with, de one of the guy with demons goes up to a rock and is basically like, St. Paisios, watch this, and hits the rock and the rock shatters. And St. Paisios goes, wow, that's really amazing. You have a lot of power. St. Paisios spits on some dirt makes it into a little ball and draws a cross on it with his finger and goes, break this. And the guy cannot break this little ball of mud with a cross on it that St. Paisios made. Now, is that because St. Paisios is magic? No, that's because St. Paisios is a man after God's heart and God is pleased to work through men who are humble. Whereas when we have hard hearts and pride and we're insecure, if God worked through us, it would just go right to our heads. So he protects us by letting us be humbled and walk that walk until we're able to you know, help people and, and work through certain things. But St. Paisios was a man who'd done that all his life. So, but what you see, getting back to uh, the demonic, what you see is that afterwards in the story, St. Paisios finds the man on a rock and the demons are beating him up. They're, they're beating him up physically. They're berating him. And he can see the man is being tortured and has bruises on him. And that's because the demons are pure ego. When this man doing what they want will gratify them, they're all excited and they're like, yeah, go show St. Paisios up. They're not rational. They're not realistic. They, the ego does not pay attention to reality. It has its own reality. It does not um, notice that God is super powerful. It does not know that he's going to win. Like it's, it's ego, it's pride, it's blind. And once, you know, those demons aren't glorified through that man defeating St. Paisios, then what does the ego do when someone's failed it? They beat him up. You see this in uh villains in movies all the time when you see you know the 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 higher villain and his underling and the underling fails the villain has to like kill him or berate him or do something to him because that's how ego works it doesn't really think through anything it, it is its own god and so the that is i would argue real spiritual warfare when we talk when we christians talk about spiritual warfare we are talking about satan and demons and real entities i would argue but when we're wanting to understand what the real warfare is, what who God, we have to understand who God is, who Satan is, and, and what we are, and that the battle is happening right down, as uh, Solzhen, Alexander Solzhenitsyn would say, right down the center of our hearts. It's not those guys versus these guys. It's not even, it's somewhat, but it's not even Christians versus atheists or stuff like that. It is pride versus humility. Does your heart 
see itself as the number one thing between it and God, you know, its own repentance, or does it blame other people, which is what Satan does. God's not the accuser. That's not what God does. Satan in scripture is called the accuser. That's his business. Yeah. There's a reason that God tells us not to go around accusing other people all the time. And the fathers, man, they say that front to back of all of church history. Mm -hmm. um, Elder Thaddeus alone will give you an earful on it. Like we have no business spending time analyzing the failures of others. Mm -hmm. There's exceptions to that, like a parent or a bishop or a priest. Um, but for the most part, that's something that we're just supposed to stay away from because it is a temptation. It is Satan's whole world. So anyways, I, I, I think it's uh, kind of the main point I'm making is I think even, even stuff like demons is totally different in orthodoxy than the West, but it makes a lot more sense. And I think we're a lot safer knowing what the demons are actually trying to trick us into. And uh, St. Isaac the Syrian, I believe it was, said that Satan will even help us overcome a sin if it's going to upgrade us to a, a higher one. And that's what we see with the Pharisees. The Pharisees, you know, they keep God's law, and yet they are the number one enemy of Jesus when he shows up. Not sinners. The Bible talks a lot about God being merciful on sinners. It's the, the prideful that are God's enemy, like of the highest caliber. And there's not talk in scripture of God being merciful on the prideful that I'm aware of. If there is, it's very rare. But it's you could get lots of stuff about God being merciful on sinners, but the prideful, it's hard to find. Yeah, so. Wow. Have you thought of writing a book? I've thought about it. We'll I see. Think, I think it would be really good. <laughs> I think everything you've talked about today is perfect material for different chapters in a book. Mm. I, I think uh, I mentioned to you this before as we were, we were talking, but I, I'm thinking maybe that prayer of St. Philaret that I read, uh, and I encourage anybody listening, look up the the, the prayer of St. Philaret because um, it's amazing, but I think all of this like spiritual mindset is in just one prayer from St. Philaret of Moscow. So I, I, it might be a good way to, to maybe write someday is to like break up that prayer and then put oh. under the categories what it mentions, but we'll see. Wow. Great idea. Do that before someone hears this and kills <laughs> your idea. <laughs> no. Well, sometimes I think of, uh, not that, not that I guess I have any good reason to do this, but uh, St. Athanasius of Alexandria in the, the fourth or fifth century. I can't get the exact centuries, but uh, he, at one point he had written a book on the spiritual life and he realized that uh, if people, if he worded stuff wrong or he made like mistakes, he could misguide people who mm. just didn't quite understand what the words meant. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, you know, anything like magic or special, it's just the nature of language that, you know, if you use a word for something and someone has never experienced that thing, they'll, they usually, I'm being a little abstract here, but they usually will fill in a meaning of something they are familiar with. So, you know, if you say faith to certain Christians, they think rational belief, like, do I rationally believe in God? For Orthodox faith, you know, rational belief is part of that, but it's a reliance on God. It's a friendship. It's a walk with him. But if I say faith to someone, they're not going to assume, hey, maybe I don't know what this word is, because that would be like, that wouldn't be functional. We couldn't walk around like every sentence people say to us. We doubt that we understand every word. It would just be chaos. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the fathers are very cautious that some of the words they say could, uh, be misunderstood. And we even see this in apophatic theology, where just like on a fundamental level, the fathers are like, sometimes we just say what God isn't, because saying what he is still might throw people up, still might be confusing. So yeah. I think I've, I guess what I'm saying is I've learned to have at least some hesitation with how much I <laughs> presume to be a teacher, as scripture would say. <laughs> and it, it warns that, you know, if you teach people, you get judged harder. It's basically what it yes, says. So that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's so true. That's why I don't. <laughs> I don't do any yeah. teaching on this. Yeah, you found the secret. You you're on here and you uh, just ask people questions. Yes. That's very smart. Very safe. <laughs> um. Uh. Okay. What else was? It? What else were we going to talk about that we? Um. Well, maybe could you? Oh, was there another book that you could recommend to maybe someone new to Orthodoxy? Just like a very basic yeah that you've gotten My, a lot out of as of as of recently i kind of have a two book two book set that's kind of like if anybody 
is just like, I want to know about orthodoxy. I want to glean a little of the treasures and I want to learn a little bit intellectually, but in a still practical way. Um, obviously the first one I already said was our thoughts determine our lives. I have, I have friends who are spiritual, but not religious. And they, they love that book. Um, Elder Thaddeus is just, you, even just in text, you can pick up, he's a little bit different kind of man, but that's most of the Orthodox saints. But uh, the other book that I would recommend, do I, oh yes, I have it right here. Um, okay, I don't have the first one, this is the second one. Uh, this series, it's a newer series, last few years, it's John Strickland's, a, I guess I would call it the age series, because each book starts with the age of, but uh, the first book is called The Age of Paradise, and it is a history of the first thousand years of Christianity. It's very readable. It's not like a boring and bland history. I think if you have any, if you have any interest in Christian history, I think this is like a more, an easier to read book and more fulfilling. But I think he really focuses in on what the heart of Christianity was, not just some doctrines and dogmas, but what the heart of it is and what it's supposed to do to hearts and how it's supposed to do that. And then he follows through the first thousand years of Christian history and shows um, how different saints fulfilled that, how the ecumenical councils fulfilled that, how it wasn't um, creations of new things. It was reaffirming, reestablishing, clarifying the same spiritual values that had always been. And the crux of his concept, which I think is phenomenal and I think is it's very important for us to understand, is that the, the idea of Christianity, as we've been talking about here, one of the main cores of it is that paradise, real peace, is something that happens in the heart. Mm -hmm. And all it should ripple out. We're supposed to be priests. This is what it means to be God's priests is to, to have this love from him, work on ourselves, have his love, and then as priests have it ripple out to creation from us, both in our, our deeds, also in our words, but even in our thoughts. That's something Elder Thaddeus talks about all the time. Quantum mechanics is affirming that people feel our thoughts. We, we think stuff. We think negative things about people. They feel it. Um, I mean, not only is it conveyed sometimes in tone, you, you can kind of, you ever talk to someone on the phone and you can tell they're not listening. I don't know how we know that, but sometimes you just know like the person probably was spacing out the last five seconds while you're talking and you ask them like, are you, are you, are you there? And they're like, Oh, oh yeah, I'm here. You're like, okay, I, you don't know how, but we can pick up these things. But yeah, our, our thoughts and everything affect people. So Strickland's main point is that if you lose that idea, if you mistake anything else as first in Christianity before work inside of you happening, you miss the whole point. And his, his tracing of history and where especially he goes in the other volumes, but he sets up just a simple version in the first book really well, is that a lot of times where Christianity has gone to its worst and darkest forms is when something external gets placed first. So once all of, you know, once, uh, well, the Crusades are an example of it where having external things be peaceful and having external things being in control is what makes Christianity successful. And so, you know, even if we have to go to war, if we have to go on crusades, you know, that will be the answer. Um, another example is, um, you know, we've got a lot of focus on social justice and there is a lot of good, a lot of uh, patristic ideas about social justice, about um, serving people who are oppressed, I guess I would say. It's very real, very true, and we should care about. But if you make that the crux of Christianity, you break it. Because otherwise you can do, like I said earlier, what Judas did. You can, you know, say, oh, look, you know, serving God is not a wise way to live, being his friend, because all the money you're putting towards that could have gone to the poor. And that means that above relationship with God is taking care of the poor. And that's not our religion. That's just not what Christianity teaches. It teaches that all these other problems, very real, very much should be concerning. And I'd argue if they're not concerning, we should ask God to soften our hearts. But regardless, all of these problems come out of our separation from God and are not being like him. Mm -hmm. So the crux of orthodoxy is if you want to heal these other problems, which you should, it all starts by working on your heart. You go to liturgy to work on your heart. You talk to your fellow Christians to work on your heart. You do these practices of Elder Thaddeus to work on your heart, to be that therapy. 
And so if we take any of these external things and we put them before that, it breaks the whole system. And so anyways, his, his book series is tracing the lineage of where that has been, where paradise first, paradise of the heart has been preserved and where certain Christian traditions have uh, branched out into putting other things first and how it just kind of spirals and goes downhill from there. So we even see that in, um, and I don't want to be too harsh on anybody, but we see that in some of the evangelicalism that I came from was, you know, we see that having beautiful music is scriptural and in the Bible, but then we make the primary measure of a spiritual experience getting really emotional about this music. And they don't think that because well, I would argue because some of these things have been lost about how to look at your inner world and your heart and what things do to you. Um, but, but a lot of them don't realize that they're there. I was, I would argue I was an addict to some of the worship music I liked. I didn't like a lot of it, but I liked some of it. And the stuff I did, I would go to the, the services, the, the worship services. They would play the music. I was a mover and dancer. I'm in the back though, because I'm shy. So I'm back there moving to the music and raving my hands. And I don't think God was like unpleased with it. But the thing was, was I wasn't there for him. I was there for the emotions. But I didn't know that because the tradition was that this was how God showed up. So I'd go there, I'd get my fix, I'd feel better. And 30 minutes later, I'm walking out, I'm walking around my college campus and I'm depressed again. Yeah. And I'm saying, why did God leave me? Like, why can't he stay with me? And the truth was, I was on an emotional high. <laughs> and so that's another external thing that you can mistake for the real deal. And that's something that even the demons are trying to do. Um, even C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, is all about the demons. They're just doing anything to distract us from God. And Lewis was right. He was reading the church fathers. That's their only goal. Get you away from God. Because if you're away from God, you'll be in yourself in some way. They don't care how it is, but they want you for their own validation to practice the same religion they do, which is self-worship. So if you worship yourself, it builds up their egos that they worship themselves. And not only that, they know exactly how to manipulate you um, because they're playing the same game. Just like if you did a job for 10 years and then someone else, you go, you move up in a rank and someone else does that job, you know, all the little ins and outs of what they're doing, why they're doing, you know, what they're missing that they're not good at. Well, this is the demon's realm. It's ego. They know it front to back. So as soon as you are in any place of ego and pride and you are not operating as if you need God at every moment, yeah. that's the, that point where unlike, you know, Harry Potter movies, that's where we're actually supposed to be concerned. That's the point where we go. I'm kind of, that, that's a state where I'm accessible to demons is when I'm trusting myself because they know every button to push to get you to do exactly what they want in that state. Whereas when you're in a state of humility um, or, or seeking that, seeking to accept the crosses and the humiliation that God allows in our lives, um, that makes our hearts softer and softer. And it's the one thing that they, I think it's a, uh, Chris system says uh, humility is the one thing that no demon can imitate. And St. Anthony, the great, uh, the, the father, very early monastic, he was, he was looking out in prayer over the world and he saw um, all these snares of Satan and all these ways that Satan tricks and deceives and gets us away from God. And he said to God, what could overcome this? How can a man go through these things where Satan has all these traps everywhere? And the Lord told him humility. And, and I think it's very important because sometimes I say, you say humility and it's kind of like, well, for one thing, once you start teaching about humility, you sound kind of dumb because it's like, what, you're an expert at humility, but thankfully we have the fathers teaching us and they actually were humble, <laughs> but they, they emphasize that humility is that state of repentance. Yeah. Humility isn't the, oh, I'm nothing. I beat myself up. There's a little bit of wording like that. Absolutely. But it's a, it's that state of really seeing that you need God. And the saints go as far as to say, one of the ways you know that that's happening is because you're judging people less, which, you know, pretty much means most of us, uh, at least me, you know, still got some work to do. But uh, it's, it's the fruit of us not looking at ourselves that we're so preoccupied with other people's flaws. Mm -hmm. um, St. Seraphim of Sarab, so many saints will say that. Uh, I, I think it's Father Seraphim Rose says, uh, if a man doesn't work on himself, Satan will give him a new job to look for flaws in others. Wow. So when we are seeking that state of humility, we're seeking to see 
how much we need God. And that's the only thing that can overcome the devil. If we think, if we operate in anything as if we don't need God, even if we think we are, if we're, if we're saying to ourselves, for example, something like, man, if I don't do this, who will, you know, I have to correct this person on the internet for their bad theology, or I have to do this. I have to show them up. These are all ways of operating as if God isn't sovereign. He's not going to do what needs to be done. And I have to do it for him. But someone who is pursuing humility, the fathers say, will do something like, I see some, someone making a mistake. I ask God, what's the best thing to do? And they default to shutting up. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's something I, I'll talk about with my clients sometimes is uh, I was talking with one recently. He was like struggling with how do I know what the right thing to do is? You know, how do I know what it is? How do I know what it is? And after I talked to him a little while, what I, what I said to him was, well, I think that looking for this has actually been some, become something that might be standing in the way of you finding what's good in situations, because God wants you to find what's good by being his friend. So if you're looking for a rule system, that's actually something that is in place of God. And it's not wrong to be looking for, you know, law and, and good rules and good ways to live. But, but the truth is, is we want to have a habit of um, looking to God first. And we want to build that and practice that. But especially if we're truly seeing ourselves like Paul models, uh, he says he's the chief of sinners. He's wrong. Uh, it's me. <laughs> the one verse every Christian has to disagree with is what Paul says he's the chief of sinners. But uh, if, if we're modeling that, um, then in most situations, and this, this is, yeah, I'll, I'll give this as advice. <laughs> I think that it's hard in any situation to choose what is difficult for yourself in prayer and that to be a wrong decision. If, if you're like, God, I don't know what to do. And you go, well, this is the hardest thing for me to do. The thing I most don't want to do. So Lord, I'm going to try and do that. Help me do it. To, to have a mindset like that, where the first thing in all situations that it needs is me to humble myself it's hard to go wrong in that state. Um, that's what even uh, Psalm 50, uh, the, the prayer David prays of repentance after uh, sleeping with Bathsheba and basically murdering her husband. Um, and that's one of our, that's like our favorite Psalm is Orthodox. He, uh, David says, you do not desire sacrifice. A heart that is broken and humble, God will not despise. I personally don't believe that there are any exceptions to that. I don't believe there is any heart that is truly broken and humble wherever they are in the world, that God will despise it, that he will turn it away. Um, I think a lot of us think our hearts are broken and humble when they're not. So that's a whole different issue. But I think if they truly are in that state, wherever we're at, I think God sees that. And he, as, uh, as he's called by one, uh, man, I can't remember her name. I think it's Hagar. Hagar has Ishmael and, and then departs from Abraham and she's crying out in the wilderness and God shows up to her and she calls God the one who sees. I think that's one of the coolest names for God, especially as we were talking earlier about like, he's there, he's sovereign, he loves you, he's watching over. She recognizes that this, having been separated from like the beginnings of the chosen people right at the get-go, the, the people of Israel, he sees her and she's the one who, she calls him that. And so I think that that's very, very key to see. And no matter what it is, he's the one who sees. So if we choose in all situations to operate as if our humiliation and our humility is the thing that's most needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Simply put, I think, I think that that's always a safe way to go. And I think those are the places where if something else is needed, he's most likely to tell us because our hearts have chosen a good portion so oh yeah gosh. that's that's kind of the the crux of so it I, I might so good oh my gosh oh I love that so much I think that's a good place to end I mean I could keep talking to you maybe I'll have you on would you like to be on one of my panel discussions I would love to have you on a panel sure yeah I'd be down for that okay I would love that I, I don't know what the topic is going to be for March but um I would love for you to be one of my guests on the panel. So um, that sounds like a blast. Why don't you, to end, why don't you just sell your coaching 
to my audience because I don't work with men. So anyone looking for a male coach should um, go with Thaddeus. So why don't you tell us just briefly how to contact you or what kind of issues you help people with? Yeah. Um, so the best the best way to get a hold of me is uh, thaddeusthought.com. And uh, there's a little tab that's coaching. So you can click on that. And that's got kind of a some of the basic rundown. Um, I, a couple of my clients are licensed therapists. I mean, I just have like a variety of people. Some are Protestants that like orthodoxy. So it's, I mean, if someone wasn't Christian at all and they wanted to meet with me, I, Hey, I'd be, I'd be down to chat with them. And I'm also, I just like talking with people. So if someone's like, I don't have money, I just want to pick your brain. I just need some help or something don't hesitate to contact me. There's a contact me page on that same website, thaddeusthought.com. Um, I would tell most people, if you want some of the basics, you can also just read Elder Thaddeus. He's a great place to start. Uh, if you read Elder Thaddeus and you want to talk about it, definitely schedule a session. Because I think, uh, you know, I, my whole thing is taking the things he's talking about and the treasures of the fathers, all these random quotes and, and strategies and stuff and, and actually applying them. Like, what does that look like in my life personally? So that's a lot of what I do. And from there, I mean, like I pointed out, psychology ties in a lot. So I, in my sessions, I'm talking about psychology, but the usual goals of therapy aren't quite similar to what I said earlier, the main goals, those often happen. My clients will be like, oh yeah, I'm less stressed about this, et cetera. But the goal is to build habits of prayer and thoughts. And it's, it's a little like cognitive behavioral therapy. There's parallels that bring us closer to God, that fight passions, that fight things that are oppressing us. Uh, yeah. So if someone isn't sure, like if it's, if they have a topic that I would talk about or something, just message me and ask, uh, I, down to down to chat with anyone so yeah awesome well thank you again so much for being my guest today i've learned a lot from you i can't wait to watch this back because you there were just so many gems in there so god bless I'm a master you. plagiarist so i've got oh. a lot a lot to plagiarize too <laughs> folders of quotes on my computer yeah well, I don't think it's plagiarism because you're giving your own Thaddeus perspective on things too, while maintaining the proper theology and everything, you know, you're not like making up your own definitions of scripture and church fathers, but you have a awesome personality. That's again, why I wanted to have you on the show is your personality, your perspective, you're, you're truly on fire for the Lord in the best way possible. And um, yeah, I just love your perspective on everything we talked about today. Thank you. I, my goal is, is like I said, at the earlier on uh, translation, like if I, yeah. it's, I mean, it's all here and anyone can read the books, but it's, a lot of it's translated weirdly. A lot of it just is not the way we use words in our culture. And so I, I my goal is to, to bring this stuff and present it in just an easy way or with metaphors. So that's, that's what I shoot to add is simplify it and maybe come up with some of my own metaphors for the yeah. Orthodox stuff. So yeah, yeah the I'm metaphors were great. Thankful anytime, anytime it's helpful to people. That's, that's what I, I want to be. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a blessing. Beautiful. And thank you to my audience. Thank you for your support, the likes, the shares, the comments. I love it all. If you want to reach out to me on Instagram, you can find me at a devotional heart. And I have a link tree link in the description of this video. It's a bit.ly link and you can find all my links in there. And until next time, I wish you all a beautiful day and God bless you.